The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Jennifer Schaus coming to you live from Washington, D.C., and we are continuing on in our summer series of 2016 federal government contracting webinars. Today we're very lucky to have Jennifer Adeli with us, who's going to be discussing color reviews for successful proposals. Uh, we do have a full hour, however, the presentation um, shouldn't take that long, so we've got plenty of time left for your questions. You can type your questions in on the lower right-hand side of the control panel, and we'll answer those in the order that they're received. In the event that we run out of time, you're certainly welcome to contact Jennifer directly, and we'll have her contact information available towards the end of the presentation. Uh, the slide that you're looking at now just gives you a list of some of the other topics that we're covering, everything from a facility security uh, officer um, uh, responsibilities over to uh, 8A and contract administration. So hope that you can join us for some more of these, and they are all being recorded and will be available for download uh, at the end of the webinar series, which will be June 17th. Uh, our agenda for today, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, Jennifer will uh, discuss her background and tell you a little bit about her firm. We'll get into the presentation. Jennifer will provide concluding remarks, and then we'll get into your questions, and Jennifer will provide answers. So again, thanks for joining us today. Um, my background, I've got about uh, almost 20 years in government contracting. I started my career with Dun & Bradstreet and their government division, and we were selling financial data and credit reports to anything from the intelligence agencies to civilian uh, and DOD. They used uh, the Dun & Bradstreet data for white collar uh, criminal investigations to general uh, GSC schedule contract awards and ensuring that the companies had the financial strength to maintain the terms and conditions within uh, your contract. Um, my firm is based in downtown D.C. Uh, I've been at this for about 10 years, and we help companies with anything from contract vehicles, sales and business development, the certifications, and then we also host events for government contractors. Uh, most notably, our uh, signature event is held at the Kennedy Center uh, several times throughout the year. So stay tuned for some event news coming up from us uh, shortly. So again, as I mentioned, we're, uh, we're very lucky to have Jennifer Adeli with us today. Um, and I will hand the microphone over to Jennifer and let her tell you a little bit about herself and her company, and then we'll dig into the presentation. Jennifer, thanks again for joining us. Great. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm so pleased to be speaking to your audience uh, and to have two Jennifers hosting today. Um, so my <laughs> name is Jennifer. Yeah. <laughs> my name is Jennifer Adeli. My company is Windows Proposals. And as you can see on the slide in front of you, I, like Jennifer Schaus, have also about 20 years of government services. Um, in my career path took me from my bachelor's in political science to working on the Hill, saving the world one piece of legislation at a time. Um, I moved into some education consulting and lobbying, working with secondary educational institutions, um, and then moved on to get my MBA locally here in Washington, D.C. at the prestigious Georgetown University and McDonough School of Business. There, I really took a focus on applying the best practices of the private sector back into the government community, um, which led me to go work with two of the big five consulting firms, Arthur Anderson, um, which uh, had its demise under the Enron scandal, if, for those of you that remember. And then I moved on to Booz Allen Hamilton. And at those consulting firms, I worked with federal agencies in their primarily civilian um, agencies like CMS and HHS and worked in their customer service areas. Um, through that, just like many of you on the phone, I wrote a lot of proposals. Um, there's a misconception out there that if you work for a big firm like that, there must be this machine in the back that's just cranking out proposals and winning business. Um, but the reality is that the folks who are the boots on the ground are the ones who are writing those proposals. They're the ones who are out there walking the halls, generating business, and then bidding on them and pricing them and winning subsequent work for your team and for the teams around you. Around that time, I began to realize that although those were wonderful companies to work in, um, I was more entrepreneurial than I could ever experience in a big firm like that. So I launched out on my own in 2005 as an independent consultant doing proposal management. Um, Jennifer, would you mind flipping back just one quick second? 
Um, so um, I started as a consultant. So I've been a proposal manager consultant since about 2005. I went in-house to a company that's probably around the size of some of the folks on the phone would like to be at one point. They were around a $100 million contractor, and I ran a very large proposal shop in-house. And then in 2011, decided to launch WinBiz, primarily with the target of working with those small and mid-sized government contractors like yourself to bring those best practices of the Booz Allen, of those big multi-million dollar companies to the smaller businesses. Thank you. So um, we are a Northern Virginia-based company, but we're 100% virtual. So our consultants work primarily at their home office or at the client side. Um, again, small and mid-sized federal contractors, as I mentioned, we're really bringing those best practices that um, we've experienced in those bigger, bigger companies to companies of your size. And people often ask us, well, you know, what industry or what agency do you work with? Do you work with the State Department? Do you work with DOD? Do you work with HHS? And the answer is yes, yes, yes. Um, we really bring these proposal management resources to any industry or any agency that you're working with. And those services are on the slide in front of you, but it's really anything that you need for proposal management, whether it's somebody to run the proposal or someone to edit it or someone to format it and look really professional. So today we're going to talk about color reviews for successful proposals. And if any of you have ever been in, um, in the throes of working on a proposal to the government, you might have heard this, this term, color review. So let's go ahead and switch to the next slide. A color review is an opportunity to stop what you're doing in the writing and take a look at your content and ask yourself, are we responding to the government's needs? Is this a winning proposal? So we're going to talk, first of all, like why do we do those color reviews, the quote, unquote, color reviews? We're going to talk a little bit about jargon and lingo. I mean, this term color review, what does it mean? What do the different steps mean? We're also going to talk about some best practices. Then, of course, we're going to cover process and tools. And then something that's really important in proposals, which is timing. Um, the government will set the schedule. They'll tell you when your proposal is due. And it's often not intuitively aligned with the level of work that it takes to respond to that proposal. So they might give you 30 days to respond to something, and you look at it, and you go, oh my god, I need 90 days to write this. Well, you're going to have to figure out a way to do it in 30 days. So we're going to talk about how to work in your color reviews in that schedule that is driven outside of your organization. So first things first, what is this term color review? So that's kind of slang that we use in the proposal management industry. And they have their history with an organization called Shipley. And Shipley's been around since the late 70s, early 80s. And they really set the gold standard for the proposal management industry. They really took a process-driven approach to managing proposals. Now, when those processes were defined, those were the good old days when you had a year to write a proposal or six months to write a proposal. And you could go through many steps. The Shipley steps actually have more than 100 steps in the full process. What the Shipley folks did was they realized that like all deliverables, all artifacts from a creative and intellectual process, whether you're writing a screenplay or you're writing a white paper or you're building a piece of art or you're building a home, there are times that you have to step back and look at where you are in the process, get an outside person to look at where you are and to confirm that everything is on track and to make corrections and then keep moving forward. So Shipley defines those using colors. Now there's nothing magical about using colors. So I do encourage folks on the phone, if your organization is saying, well, pink means this and red means that and it's causing a lot of confusion, call it whatever you want. If it was review one, review two, and your organization understands the difference between re review one and review two, that is perfectly fine. But we're going to talk about the lingo and about pink, red, and gold because you're probably going to find on proposals, especially with, if you're teaming with other large organizations, that they're going to use this lingo. They're going to call it pink, red, gold in most cases. So I want you to know what those mean. So let's also talk about what color re reviews are not, what they're not intended to be. 
you know, these are not an opportunity to say, to smack someone on the hand and say, I told you so, I told you that was wrong. That's just not really a good environment for fostering collaboration in something as critical as your company's next big win. Color reviews are also not intended to be an opportunity to actually fix the problem right there and then. So real-time solutioning, if somebody brings up an issue, let's say with a technical approach in your proposal, they say, you know, this is not really technically feasible the way that you've described it. In a color review, at that actual milestone, we typically don't recommend that you fix it right then. You flag it, and then you develop a solutioning session outside of that meeting for the smart people in the room to get together and to fix that problem. And it's also worth mentioning that color reviews are not an opportunity to brain flex. Um, again, going towards that mindset of this is a collaborative environment, everybody needs to work together when it comes to government proposals. This is not really an opportunity to just show off um, what you know. Now, if what you know is an opportunity to improve that proposal, then absolutely bring it to the table. But if it's a way to just sort of talk about your inside knowledge about the customer and it's not really going to change your proposal approach, let's table that for another discussion. So now that we know like what they're called and what they're not, let's talk about why we do these. And as I mentioned, just like any creative process, it's important to stop what you're doing at some point and, and take a step back. And so that's the most overarching theme that I want you to leave with today is that when you're pressed for time, there's a tendency to just power through and that train is on the track and it's rolling out of control and we don't have time to stop. But actually stopping and taking a read and getting some outside perspective and also most importantly for your writers to get some sleep and to get their fingers off the keyboard and to get their eyes off the screen that time is actually much more valuable than spending it continuing to hack away at the content. We also do these reviews as an opportunity to think like a government evaluator. So to look at the scorecard that they're going to use against you and to ask yourself how you score against it. Because it's really easy to take your eye off that score and to just focus on your own messaging and to forget what the government's looking for. This is also an opportunity to look for holes in the content any risks in the solution, risks in the teaming, and opportunities for improvement. Finally, proposals, as you may know, often are very strict on their page limits and their format. So if you're working and your content is all in you know, Arial, but the proposal is required to be submitted in Times New Roman, you might find that your page limits are very off, so you want to see it in the correct format. And then finally, color reviews are an opportunity to bring in the executive who are not in the trenches of the proposal and to get their buy-in. So I promised you that we would talk about jargon. So on the screen, you see some of the terminology that are used most often in color reviews. Pink team, it's that first review. And it's pink, it's light, it's like a light red, right? So it should be about 80% written. Now these are not hard and fast rules, but these are back of the envelope um, scale that most people in the industry use. Your organization may apply a different standard, but as long as you know that it increases from pink to red to gold, generally 80% or so at pink team, first draft. Some organizations that we work with, this is just an annotated outline. It just has bullet points of the talking points that they're going to address. It might have, um, somebody may have drawn a picture on a whiteboard and taken a picture of it and inserted that hand-drawn image in the annotated outline saying that in the future we want a graphic that's going to depict this. At Red Team, you should be about 90% written. If you have any holes, they are known. You might have a placeholder and they're saying, we are aware this is a hole, we will have this filled by Friday. And then Gold Team, it's 100% written, it's the gold standard, it's the gold medal. That thing should be tight, there should be no holes. It, if you had to, you could push submit right then and have a pretty solid proposal. But that being said, goal team is an important step because you're going to still find little tweaks that you can do to improve it. So this is where you're adding that cherry on top. This is where you're fine tuning um, one voice, making sure that something you said on page five is the same way that you described it on page 55. Another important step that we're not gonna spend a lot of time on today, but it is part of the color review process, is something that's called the white glove. So this is the white glove standard. This is the five-star service. This is where you're going through each page of the proposal, 
one by one and you're reading it or at least scanning it from top to bottom. And you're looking at things like, are the graphic exhibits called out correctly? Do we reference them in the document? Um, do we have the, the right name for the program manager? You know, we changed Joe to Jane in the last minute. Make sure that Jane's name appeared everywhere. Other terminology that you might hear when you're going through a color review is the red line. This is the markup on the proposal. This is usually track changes or comments that are in your document. We often use the term recovery. This is the time period after the review that you're recovering from it. You are acting on the findings from the review. And then we use an in-brief and a debrief. The in-brief is exactly what it sounds like. It's to kick off the review and to distribute those instructions. And the debrief is the time that you really dig into them and formulate that recovery plan. So let's talk about some best practices. Um, it can be tempting sometimes to jump right into a review and just say, OK, five people, here's the proposal. Read everything. Um, lock yourself in a room and get back to me at 2 o'clock. Well, we've learned over time that that is not really a very productive way of handling a color review. So some of the things that you can take away with you today when you're implementing your first or you're trying to improve your last color review. First off, clearly explain the instructions and the roles and the deadlines and the rules of your review. So for example, if you're telling everybody, don't make any red line changes. I only want you to submit comments in that little side bubble in the Word document. You're going to want to tell them that up front so that everybody can follow those rules. Another best practice is to assign readers to sections. And we're going to talk about some suggested page limits and turnaround times. Um, but ultimately, unless it's a very short proposal, like 10, I'm sorry, 15 or 20 pages or less, um, nobody really has a bandwidth to read the whole thing front to back and to be productive. Another rule of thumb that you should always follow is to not review your own work. If you and uh, your cub cubicle mate there are the only ones who have been writing this proposal, we recommend that you bring in an outside person to do a review. Another recommendation is to provide the win themes and reference materials to the reviewers and to make sure that they have read it in advance. So um, I think reviews be very counterproductive when people are commenting on something in the proposal because they haven't read the RFP itself and they're not aware of the requirements. So let's say that the resume requirement is no more than two pages. And somebody's commenting on the resume and they're saying, Joe has a much better resume. Here it is. This is his five-page version. Well, they haven't read the RFP instructions. And that's just a counterproductive comment. Jennifer, I just got an error message on audio. Can you still hear me? Uh, yes, I can still hear you. It did cut out for a okay. moment, but I think we're good. OK, good. Thank you. Another best practice is to use the government's evaluation criteria. Typically, that's called Section M. Um, but somewhere in your proposal, even if they don't call it Section M, I'm sorry, in your RFP, there's going to be somewhere in there the evaluation criteria that the government is using to score you. So it's really important to use that when you're assessing yourself and not some other internal guidance. If you have the ability to bring in another independent person, they can check compliance on the proposal. And as I mentioned, make sure that you give reviewers enough time to read in detail. And I'll give you some examples here in a few minutes. In today's day and age, best practices are to do your review in soft copy and preferably online. Even if you're meeting face-to-face -face in the same um, meeting room for your debrief, those comments can still be done in excuse me, an electronic version online. And that just makes the recovery period so much faster. OK, here's a few more best practices for you to think about. It's really tempting to get into a review and focus on things like typos and grammar and formatting. Um, but really, those should be handled by the editor later in the process. So advise your reviewers to not comment on those, even if they see them. And if you're able to clean those up in advance of distributing the file to the reviewers, it's going to keep them from focusing on those little cherry picking items. But sometimes reviewers, they just cannot resist the temptation to fix a typo. And you're going to still get those. But the more that you can get people to um, put 
push those aside and focus on the meat of that sentence and not the fact that the word is spelled wrong, um, you're going to have a much better outcome. And, and as reviewers are making um, comments on there, it's really important that they focus on making suggestions. So as you're going to your teams and you're doing a, a color review and you're giving that in brief, remind them that if they find something wrong, to make a suggestion for how to fix, to fix it. So instead of just saying, you know, this doesn't make sense, tell us why it doesn't make sense and how to fix it, you know, add this point or add this data metric. And then encourage your reviewers, if they see something that really works in one section, to bring it up as an example of what's good and not just what's bad. And on, on our teams, we call it no seagulls allowed. So don't just text them to death. If you see something that looks good and you think that it could be used elsewhere or that format can be used elsewhere or that table was a really good way of presenting the data, bring it to the attention of the team so that they can use it in other sections. Okay, so we talked about timeline, and, and as I mentioned, you know, you're going to be under a lot of pressure. Your schedules are going to be really tight. Sometimes they're just, they just don't make sense. I mean, the government might give you two weeks to turn around something, and my gosh, we're all working 40 hours a week, billable with a client, and how am I going to do this? So here are some best practices for you to use when you're scheduling your color reviews. Now, these are human beings who probably have billable work during the day, and they've got soccer games to get to at night, and then they're probably going to be reviewing this content after hours or in between meetings during the day. So my experience has shown that if your content is very complex and it's very dense and it's got lots of jargon and it's very technical, that really you can't expect a person to do a good quality read any faster than five pages an hour. If you give them a very complex and dense proposal to read and you only get and you expect them to do 10 pages an hour, yeah, they're going to say that they got through it, but they're not going to give you really constructive feedback. If your content is a little bit more like average complexity, it's not super jargony, it's not super complex, it doesn't have a lot of technical detail, or the statement of work that you're responding to is not super complex, you might be able to get about eight pages per hour for a reviewer. And if it's a little lighter, um, maybe around 10 pages per hour. Now, that's how many pages per hour you can read, but we're not machines. We can't read for 12 hours nonstop. So our experience has shown that readers really get to fatigue at four hours max. And that's four hours if they have turned off all their other systems and they're not on Facebook and they're not checking their emails and they're not multitasking while they're in some other meeting. So really the best result is, believe it or not, at around 15 pages or so and about two hours of their undivided attention. It's really hard in today's day and age, especially for small and growing businesses, for people to carve out more than a couple of hours because most of you are probably wearing eight hats, not to mention your obligations with family and community outside of that. So when you're looking at your proposal and it's 50 pages and you're thinking, okay, if I give everybody 15 or 20 pages, how many reviewers do I need? Okay, I'm going to need three or four reviewers so that I can make sure that everybody really only has to carve out about two hours of reading time. Then when you add on an in-brief to distribute the instructions and you add on a debrief to go over the findings, which I recommend that also take about two hours, maximum of three hours. I've seen uh, just death march debriefs of four hours or more and people just really glaze out and it just has diminishing returns. You're still looking at a commitment of between four to six, maybe as many as seven hours total time commitment, including the time that they might need to read that RFP in advance. So I emphasize this to you because it's really important that you gather as many folks from your team and that includes teammates and subcontractors if it's appropriate to help them, to ask them to volunteer, to ante up two hours of reading, five hours of total time to make your proposal the best that it can be. So here's a, here's a suggested schedule. You know, I mentioned that people might be doing their reviews in between other meetings and they have family and community obligations after hours and on the weekend. So some of the, um, results that we've had the most success with, or a schedule that we've had the most success with, is to give people flexibility by doing that kickoff or that in-brief 
in the afternoon on one business day, distributing the files to them still during business hours, but late in the day, maybe 3.34, you know, before 5 o'clock if you can. Give them that two to four hours of uh, content that they're going to need to read and allow them to do it in the after hours um, between other obligations. Have them send their comments to you at 9 a.m. So note that if you give the files to them at 3 if people have blocked off their time and they really only have about two hours of content, they can probably get all their reading done during business hours and you're not having to infringe into their after hour obligations. But if, they, if they're not able to still do it during business hours and they're able to squeeze it in after they've dealt with their evening commitments, then they can still get their comments to you at 9 a.m. Some people are real early risers. They might get up at 6 in the morning and do their two hours then. Give their, uh, if you get them to submit their comments back to you in the morning, say 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning, then whoever is running your proposal, whether it's a formal proposal manager or a program manager or even um, an executive assistant level person who can compile all those comments together. And I recommend adjudicating or cherry picking off some of the easy stuff up front. That way when you're in your debrief, you can focus on the real meaty stuff. And you can do your debrief for approximately two hours. Um, I sometimes recommend doing a lunch hour because people do tend to not have other business or client obligations during that time. If you're meeting face-to-face, -face, you can feed them. That definitely uh, garners favorable experience for the reviewers and rewards them and it, you know, acknowledges the fact that they're giving up valuable time to make this proposal better. And then you can debrief from 11 to 1. And then, again, take a little bit of time for your proposal manager about an hour after that debrief to wrap up all the loose ends and document all the action items and then to distribute the recovery assignments and the new files to the team around 2 o'clock. So you'll notice that this is just under a 24-hour cycle, but the actual reviewers maybe only need to commit between you know, around 4 hours or so all in. But your proposal team is taking a whole 24 hours of cycle. That's also giving your writers 24 hours of not working in the content while everybody else is reviewing it. So that's the schedule that you would look at on like an individual 24-hour basis. But how do we fit this into our overall proposal schedule? So on the screen there, you see a sample 30-day proposal. And this would be 30 days, you've got a full cadence to do a pink team, a red team, and a gold team. Another best practice that we've found is don't do color reviews on a Friday. And that can be really tempting because a lot of times people don't have client obligations on a Friday. They might have a government contractor who is on a 4-10 schedule and you're, you're thinking to yourself, well, my client is not in the office on a Friday, so that's a good time for me to work on proposals. But we found that if you do a color review on a Friday and you're ending at a 4 o'clock or 3 o'clock on a Friday afternoon to, to do your debrief, that by the time people pick up the content and start working on it Monday morning, a lot of that tacit information that they absorbed has escaped their mind over the weekend. So our best success has come from a Wednesday-Thursday cadence, distributing the files on a Wednesday afternoon, as I showed, and then just debriefing on a Thursday. And that's what gives a full business day before you enter into the weekend to start acting on those findings. So now that we've talked about schedule and we've talked about you know, how much content to deliver to your reviewers, let's talk a little bit about some of the tools and the materials that you'll need to run a successful review. Now, I've seen reviews that are super unorganized and people are very frustrated because their time is not being used efficiently and maybe people don't have access to the RFP and people can't find the review files. So I do recommend that whoever is facilitating your color review Take a little bit of time in advance to make sure that you're organized, that you have checklists and that you have all the tools necessary to be successful. As I mentioned, online document management or online reviewing is the best practice that we're seeing in the industry nowadays. Now, if we had had this webinar 10 years ago or even five years ago, we would have seen a lot of more companies still doing their reviews face-to-face. Um, now, that is still very important, and I'll talk about that in a second, but in the meanwhile, 
because of the broad use of tools like SharePoint, especially the newest installations of SharePoint through the Office 365 environment, tools like Dropbox or even Google Docs or Box.net, and I'm sure that you have other ones that you're using, there might, um, there's ShareFile, there's a whole bunch of options out there to manage your documents online securely and in a way that you can distribute it to your reviewers seamlessly. This is really important because you don't have time to break up a 50-page proposal into five, um, 10-page documents and distribute it out to 20, you know, five different reviewers then get their comments and then merge them all back and how to have to deal with the way that Microsoft Word handles merging files and track changes and all that, it can get really ugly really fast. If you're able to use an online tool or if you have an internal system that maybe is inside your firewall but is still seamlessly syncing, that is definitely the gold standard. On top of that, even if you're meeting face-to-face, -face, nowadays most people have, most meetings have somebody who needs to dial in remotely. So there are tools like WebEx, like GoToMeeting that we're using today, Skype for Business, and so many other ones to help you facilitate that meeting and that conversation. Some of them even have the ability to whiteboard real time and to use the text chats like we're going to use here for questions and answers, and that can really facilitate your meeting smoothly. Just like with any webinar, with that virtual meeting, you're going to want to test it in advance, make sure people have logins, make sure people have their content, I'm sorry, their software up to date so that your meeting goes smoothly. And then finally, even if you're doing a primarily virtual meeting room, if some of your folks are co-located, it is really helpful to have that face-to-face. -face. Nothing really replaces that. So while you can make the best of that virtual meeting room, if you can do it in conjunction with some of the key decision makers sitting there face to face and collaborating, you will have a, um, a exponential increase in the positive outcomes of your review. And then finally, you're going to need your evaluation criteria and your score sheet. And I have an example of that on the next page. Now I mentioned earlier in, in briefly that you're going to want to use the government evaluation criteria in your review. Now, at the pink pane, when you're kind of just feeling out your proposal, you've got placeholders for a lot of content, it's okay if you're not applying the government standards to you quite yet, because you're not going to be at that level. You're only 80% written. But by the time that you're at a red team, and definitely at a gold team, you should be applying to yourself the criteria that the government is going to score you with. And here's an example. This was one from a proposal with Space and Missile Command a couple of years ago. And they had, in their technical um, requirements, they had a combined technical and risk rating. This is the technical score only. There was a risk scale as well. So when we gave the reviewers the technical volume to review, we gave the technical evaluation criteria to them, and we flagged the good and the outstanding criteria. And we told them, we cannot win with acceptable. So if we're not scoring at a minimum good, and we really want to score outstanding, we need to evaluate that. We need to know that now. So we had them, this is just a clip of it, but what we did is we had them, they gave, we gave them an Excel score sheet and they indicated where we were, if we were marginal, acceptable, good, or outstanding, and they did that for each subsection. And then they put notes in there about why we were good, or why we were outstanding, or why we were only acceptable. And these notes are intended to be a summary level. The details, the meat, are in the actual proposal document itself. But at a high level, we want to be able to look and consolidate you know, three or four or five different reviewers evaluate their score, and if Joe says we're outstanding, but Jennifer thinks we're only acceptable, then we need to talk about that in the debrief and figure out where we really think we are, and what did Jennifer find that Joe did not see that we need to address. Now, you can build these score sheets in a number of different ways, but you do want to always make sure you use that criteria. So to, to wrap up the proposal, we talked about um, the, what they are, why we use them, what the jargon is, some of the tools and best practices, 
timeline considerations, how to work it into your schedule, how to assign a manageable level of content to review, and then finally some of the things that you're going to need like your in-person meeting uh, equipment, your virtual meeting equipment, and score sheets. What I want you to walk away with today is that reviews are absolutely vital to the writing process. And as I said at the outset, it's really tempting to just jump on that train and it's running away and you're going you know, 100 miles an hour and you've got 30 days to deliver this and it's tempting to just write, 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 write. But like all creative, because I do think proposals are a creative process as well as a technical process, in all creative processes you need to step back and evaluate and get an outside perspective. They are vital to the writing process. Give yourself enough time to be effective. Don't squeeze it in. Don't multitask. Your proposals will be much better off for it. And then use the tools and technology and the score sheets that make sense for your organization. If your organization is primarily face-to-face -face and you're very collaborative and you walk the hall, then by all means have that face-to-face -face meeting. If your organization functions very highly by being virtual, then use the virtual tools that you're used to. And I thank you so much for your time. I hope you um, found some benefit on this discussion of color reviews. I think we're going to open up for questions and answers. Absolutely. Thank you, Jennifer. That was outstanding. And uh, it looks like we do have some questions coming in. So again, we will uh, take those in the order that they are received. Uh, I'm going to put the slide up that has Jennifer's contact information. So if you do have any questions directly for her, you can reach out um, to her either by phone or email or jump on her website to learn uh, more about their services. So the first question uh, comes in and says, what if we do not have enough time for a review? Okay, I'm so happy that you asked that question because that's pretty much the first thing that comes up and that's why I did emphasize timing so much. So the example that I gave you on the screen there is a 30-day proposal, but so often we have only 15 days or sometimes with task orders you might have 7 or even 10 days. Um, what's most important is that if you don't have the time to do pink, red, gold or 1, 2, 3, it's most important that you do at least one review. So, and that you do it at the time that is most beneficial to your organization. So I wouldn't recommend having that one review be when you're at the annotated outline level. I would recommend that that review be when you're in the 90th percentile um, done with your content so that you're, you're really looking at content that you can act on. That being said, if you have a very abbreviated schedule and you're only able to do one formal review, it's important that you still break into your schedule um, a little mini reviews along the way, and that might be your proposal manager checking in daily with the writers to make sure that they're on schedule and do they have any questions, um, and having making sure that the executive team is aware of where the proposal is going and the path and the solution that you've developed all along so that you don't get a surprise at that red team review, you know, on the 10th out of 14th day, and all of a sudden all your hard work has to get re-engineered. So make sure that that review is done at the most advantageous time. Great. Uh, our company only has two people and we are both involved in writing the proposal. Where can we go to find an independent set of eyes to review our proposal and how much time should we, in advance, should we reach out? Sure. Great question. So let me answer the last part first. I would say reach out early and reach out often. Um, when the proposal is first released or even in advance, if you have teammates, um, if you are partnering with another organization on your proposal, by all means, invite them to your review. And in most cases, the only time that you wouldn't want them to see your content is with the pricing. Um, I would not invite your teammates to review any of the pricing or the business volume. Or if there is a technical part of your solution that is proprietary and sensitive, I would not assign them those sections. But otherwise, teammates, subcontractors, prime, um, if you're in a mentor-protege relationship, even if your mentor is not involved in that specific time, uh, I'm sorry, in that specific opportunity, you may be able to have your mentor volunteer a few hours of their time as well. And then finally, if you are in that kind of situation, companies like Windows, we offer color review services as well, where we will do a compliance check and a review as a third-party associate 
um, coming in sight unseen, just like your evaluator is going to do, and we can provide that service for you as well. That's an excellent question. Great. Um, should independent reviewers be required to sign a non-disclosure agreement? So I would refer to your company's culture and your company's um, contract guidelines for that, but I would say that in most cases, yes. So for example, if we provide a independent compliance review for our client, we always have an NDA, and that's a bilateral NDA. If you have teammates or subcontractors um, who are participating in the review, most likely you have an NDA in your teaming agreement as well. If you feel like your NDA does not sufficiently cover the proposal, then I would not hesitate to execute a side one specific to that proposal, and you're going to find that most companies, they don't even blink an eye at doing that. But, it, but that is smart to make sure that you're totally covered, and also so that everybody takes it seriously, so that they understand that this is important content, and we're, we're asking you to help us, but we also need to be protected. Great. Excellent question. Uh, you're super, thanks. Now, the, uh, your last slide showed a compliance matrix, and if our proposal comes in only as acceptable and not outstanding, should we still submit the proposal? Ooh, so that's a much bigger question that has to do with things like bid decisions and your strategic positioning and your capture and business development process. Um, in most proposals, there's going to be um, for there's going to be evaluation criteria for different elements, and they might be weighted. So, and we could have a side conversation. Um, I definitely encourage the person who's asking that question to reach out to me. We could definitely have a side conversation on that and dive really deep into it. But at a high level, evaluation over, evaluation criteria is typically ranked. So they might say the technical solution is more important than past performance, which is more important than personnel, and all three combined are more important than price. So they've given you the order. So you might sit there and say, okay, if our technical solution scores um, good, I'm sorry, or like the second highest one, I think it was um, acceptable, and that's the highest ranking item, but our past performance is going to be outstanding, and our personnel is going to be outstanding, and our price is going to be outstanding, then internally you're going to ask yourself, wow, with those weighted in the way that the government has described, do we still have a viable shot at winning, even if our technical solution we think is going to score you know, second place versus first place? And those are really important discussions to have with your proposal team and your business development team. Sometimes those answers don't come until you're mired in the proposal crisis. And sometimes you do have to make a decision you know, maybe midway through the proposal, as you're looking at your solution, you're thinking, oh my gosh, can we really pull this together with the team that we have? Is it better for us to cut bait on this one and not submit something that's only going to score marginal? Or does it make sense for us to save those, you know, resources for another one that we can put a stronger position? And I will footnote that with saying that sometimes the answer is yes. Submitting a marginal proposal is, excuse me, is more of a marketing piece to get you in front of a customer that you're trying to break into. So there's, there's a lot of strategy that goes into that. I'd be happy to explore that in another conversation. Great. Uh, what if there's a disagreement on the content between somebody on the pink versus somebody on the red team? Should the red team trump the pink team? Ooh, you guys have such great questions. Um, so what you're getting at is something that we did not touch on, but it is an important thing to consider if you're able to, which is having the continuity of reviewers from pink to red to gold. Now, sometimes at Gold Team, you might take out your subcontractors because by then you've put in sensitive information in your content. But if you're able to have the same people review it at pink and then at red, um, the conflict between the red and the, pink, and the pink review will be minimized um, because the people will have seen the evolution of their content. Um, but really, you, you, that does come up, and really it's up to the team to adjudicate those findings. So let's say at Pink Team, you were going down one path, and the reviewer said, you know, this doesn't work, we want to go with Solution B, and then Solution B is written up, and then at Red Team, those reviewers are going, no, 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 never mind, we like Solution A better. That's really where you kind of need to take a timeout 
pull those decision makers offline into a separate solutioning discussion and adjudicate the findings that you have at the pink and the red and say, okay, what's going on here, guys? You know, why are we not in agreement on the path that we need to take? And maybe you come up with a solution C altogether. Um, I've had the other thing happen too, and this is worth mentioning, where somebody might make a comment that is for for one reason or another it's um, overridden. So they might say, why are you only submitting you know, this past performance, I think you should submit this other past performance. And then a question and answers come out and an amendment comes out and clarifies your past performance requirements. And so then you get your red team or the gold team and that same reviewer who's unaware of the change in the RFP gets really missed and says, why did you not take my feedback? Why did you not ask on my feedback? So it's really important as you evolve the proposal especially if you overwrite people's comments, um, that you explain to them either as part of the debrief process or in a side conversation to let them know why you're not accepting those changes that they recommended. Um, and that will definitely minimize the churn and the um, sort of back and forth between the reviewers about, you know, who's right, who's wrong, that, that tension that can kind of build. Great. And then looks like one last question here. Who should actually be doing the reviewing? So that kind of builds off of what we talked about before. You know, we should not have the same people review their own content. Now, in that example of only two people are writing, if you're able to even just swap each other's content and, you know, Sarah reads Jennifer's and Jennifer reads Sarah's, then that will help. Beyond that, other people in, on your team, especially executive membership, executive leadership, or program managers, um, it's really important, for example, if you're developing a management approach for a proposal and a program manager who's going to have to implement that management approach, they're a perfect person to read it if they did not write it. Um, because they're ultimately the one who knows the environment, knows the clients, they're going to have to implement that management approach. Um, technical SMEs, if you bring in your subject matter experts who are in the field who are either doing work on a similar client or going to do that work going forward, they're great reviewers. And what you're doing there too is you're starting to assimilate them to the proposal process. So you might have a subject matter expert who's stuck down at the Pentagon all day and has never worked on a proposal in their life, but you're bidding their resume in a new proposal going forward. If you can bring them into the proposal process and have them read even just a few pages that are around their specific technical area of expertise, you're starting to build future proposal writers. So the proposal review is a great entry place for someone to get their feet wet. And then finally, besides a company like WinBiz, outside consultants in your industry are a great way to bring in reviewers. And those could also be contingent hires. So I've seen a lot of clients bring in a contingent hire on a 1099 basis and say, we're going to give you 10 hours. Here's a purchase order for 10 hours of your time. Can you participate as a color reviewer on this proposal that if we win, you're going to get a job out of it. So it's a great way to hook them in to the future success of that project and to hook them in at the proposal, at the proposal level. Great, and I think that's it for questions. So again, Jennifer, thank you so much for the fantastic and very insightful content uh, and answering all the questions as well. Um, again, here's our list of the uh, additional webinars that are coming up uh, the rest of this week and all throughout next week. Uh, any last final thoughts that you have, Jennifer, and then we'll, uh, we'll close the webinar. No, excellent questions, everyone. Feel free to reach out directly if you have a follow-up question or um, want to dive in future, uh, dive in more on those questions about bid decisions and overall strategy. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jennifer, and thanks everybody for joining us.